Bread for the World and other Christian groups of all stripes and Jews and Muslims and lots of secular people are working together to form a circle of protection around programs focused on poor and hungry people in our own country and around the world. Some leading politicians are saying we ought to really go after those programs for poor people. We need to reduce the federal deficit, but it is not necessary to make life yet tougher for moms who are trying to put food on the table for their kids. And it's not right, after all that poor people have been through, especially over the last few years, to hit them while they're down. Taking care of the most needy is going to, as it's always been at its best, a private public cooperative venture. The notion that it is the job and the job only of government to do it, which I know is an oversimplification of a liberal approach, is neither appropriate nor true. The presumption, again an oversimplification of the right, that people of goodwill acting as private citizens can take care of all this is nuts. It's not possible. Government programs are really important uh, especially in this economy, uh, food stamps, for example, school lunches, those programs provide 16 times as much food for hungry families in our own country as do all the charities and food banks in the country. 16 times. If Congress cuts the food stamp program or the, the women and children program that feeds hungry children and infants, uh, there is no way that churches and charities can, can pick up that help. We are facing right now a, a slew of problems. We have been living beyond our means. We have an aging population. We have, uh, we have uh, our, our demands overseas that we must meet. And we have a slowing economy. What I would argue is the response to this is to use this opportunity of having to do something about the fiscal problem to put in place long-term policies. If cuts are made simply to get to a bottom line so a deal can be made, then real lives in the short term are going to be impacted. People who are getting support to eat, people who are getting support to make sure their kids aren't left alone on the streets are going to be impacted. So what it always comes back to is each side refusing to see the real cost of what it wants to do. The majority of the benefit of the tax cuts over the last decade have been to the upper income people. Now it may be a time to say, you know, we're going to have to start increasing taxes a little bit and we may ask you to pay some a bigger share of that increase because the people at the lower incomes, they are vulnerable right now. We have 15 million unemployed people. They can't afford to meet these increases and in the need for increased tax revenue. You have a little bit extra, and we're going to ask you if you can help us out now at this point. God, we stand in witness. Around the world, almost a billion people uh, go without enough calories to make their bodies work right. Um, so in those families, a lot of kids die unnecessarily. In our country now, uh, partly because of the recession, one in four children is living in a household that runs out of food. We will, won't succeed unless people of faith also get engaged through organizations like Bread for the World. It's people of faith who need to contact their senators and representatives, give them a call and say, you know, I, I really want you to get to a deal. I want you to work across party lines to govern the country for our good. And especially, I want you to protect poor and hungry people. So there's a real role for religious leaders in the debt and deficit debate. Every faith tradition on the planet is here because their founder said we're not going to do business as usual. Let's see religious leaders turn to political leaders, conservative and Republican, and say to them, do not be defined by inherited dogma. Do better. That's the message of all of our traditions. <laughs>